really a pleasure to have Colin Yang here as part of our uh, Surveillance Democracies Mountain Sawyer Seminar Series that um, myself, particularly is really Social Media and Science and Technology studies so running along with Professor Chandra here at the law school. Yeah. Um, Professor Yang is a professor of communications and sociology at the Annenberg School of Communication and the Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also a member of the Center of Study in Contemporary China and the Center for East Asian Studies. His research areas cover digital media, digital communication, global communication, social movements, cultural sociology, and the sociology of China. He spent the last 15 years studying how Chinese citizens have harnessed social networking and the internet as tools for civic activism. He's the author of two books, The Red Guard Generation of Political Activism in China, which is forthcoming from Columbia University Press, and The Power of the Internet in China, Citizen Activism Online, also from Columbia University Press, which was the winner of the Best Book Award of Communication and Information Technology. He is also the editor of three volumes, China's Contested Internet, The Internet, Social Media, and Change in China, and Re-Envisioning the Chinese Revolution, the Politics and Poetics of Collective Memories in Reform China. And numerous articles, some of the most on some of the most important topics facing us today, ranging from how emotional processes affect mobilization online to online activism as compared to various protest movements, cyber politics, memories of the Cultural Revolution, and the question of hegemony, the rise of Chinese here and the question of food safety. Today he's going to speak about regulating the Chinese internet in the name of civility. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yang. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And uh, um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Chen especially and for inviting me to this uh, wonderful occasion. It's a great pleasure. Um, it's also a, a, a sort of the right moment uh, for, for me because uh, for many years I've been working on the internet activism in China. But uh, relatively recently I've decided uh, to take a closer look at the other side of the picture, you know, the government and how government uh, regulates and uh, manages the internet. Um, so I've been working on a couple of uh, uh, papers, uh, and today's talk is based on one of these working papers. It's uh, sort of uh, in a very rough shape, and uh, that's why it's uh, a good time for me to get some uh, responses and feedback. Um, okay, so this is uh, the, the topic today, regulating the internet in China in the name of civility. And uh, the discourse of civility is not unique to China. It's actually a prevalent discourse in the United States, right here, right now. But uh, since when? This uh, article on the left-hand side from New York Times, that was 1997. An, an op-ed was already lamenting the decline of civility in politics, going, going, gone. Um, from the left, and then from the right, literally and um, intellectually and uh, socially. Um, Russ Limbaugh has this uh, quite intriguing and interesting interview on his uh, radio show, uh, where he says, he claims that civility is the new censorship, that the left is using civility to catch up us and this uh, so this discourse is also quite uh, prevalent and ongoing debate about civility in the United States right here. Um, there are a lot of projects about civility. Uh, this one on the left is a Rutgers project um, called Project Civility. And on this project website, it says this two-year dialogue, not just about matters, aims to cultivate passion, compassion, Courtesy. So that's, there are projects in educational institutions 
to cultivate to uh, civility. And then there are also very, this is very recent, recently published uh, article in the first amendment studies where um, uh, in this case, for instance, uh, again, the uh, civility is um, um, critiqued as a kind of uh, threat to economic freedom. This ongoing dis debate and discourse about civility in contemporary American society. In China, the discourse of civility uh, and the civilization has also been uh, very common and increasingly common. Uh, this, on the right hand, uh, the character is literally means uh, civilization. And this is a publication, an online publication produced by the China Center in the Australian National Australian University. Uh, they published a, a China Star Yearbook for a number of years. For 2013, civilization civility was the keyword for the entire yearbook of that year. Just showing that in 2013, suddenly, uh, civilization, the discourse of civilization, uh, took on some special significance. And I'll explain why later on, why 2013 um, seems to be an interesting uh, turning point. In order to understand the relevance and significance of this, of this discourse of civility and civilization, we need to understand a little bit. Uh, I'm sure you understand you know, a lot about the Chinese internet and web spaces, but I want to uh, emphasize a few points just to sort of uh, lay the groundwork for our uh, analysis. I want to em emphasize three points, uh, of, well, four points actually. First is the uh, you know, main argument in my book in 2009, The Power of the Internet, is an argument about how Chinese web and Chinese internet is a critically contentious space. It's full of critical voices, very contentious space. Um, so activism, protest, um, dirty language as well. The second point is that it's also a messy space. If you know, if you have visited Chinese uh, big Chinese cities and uh, um, visited the popular tourist places, you know the Chinese streets are messy streets, right? It's crowded and uh, um, but interesting, fascinating sometimes. Uh, good restaurants, uh, but could also be dirty. It's messy. Especially in a few countries nowadays, the Chinese the websites are becoming more and more civilized. But years back, if you look at the uh, websites, Chinese popular websites, they are as messy as Chinese streets. <laughs> interesting, in interesting ways. Sometimes in interesting ways, sometimes you know, it's, it's dirty. But it's messy, and that's an interesting feature, I think, of the Chinese internet. In the language of civility that is increasingly used to govern the Chinese internet space, um, the language of vulgarity has been used quite often to describe the Chinese internet. But because of its because it's messy, it actually has a lot of vulgar stuff, you know, um, dirty language, rumors, false information. So it's also vulgar from the point of view of the regulators. That's why I put it in quotation marks. You know, it's uh, from a particular perspective. Because of these features, that is contentious, it's messy, and it's vulgar, uh, the government from the very beginning, very beginning meaning the mid-1990s, has, has been conscientiously trying to regulate the internet. So numerous uh, policies, regulations uh, from all kinds of departments all kinds of ministries, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Education, certainly Ministry of Information Technology, Public Security, State Council, all government agencies have their <coughs> policies about a particular aspect of the internet. So we've, we've had numerous policies aimed at regulating the internet, how people can, how, what kind of things people can say and so on. But I, uh, what I say here is that many regulations but only half successes, not entirely successful, that China's internet continues to be 
contentious and messy and vulgar, despite all these kind of uh, regulations and despite all these efforts and resources and money and personnel invested in the governing of the Chinese cyberspace. Uh, on the right hand, if you Google the grassnut horse lexicon, if this lexicon is created, maintained by a Chinese by, by a website in Berkeley, a uh, group of researchers uh, called China Digital Times, it's a fascinating lexicon of the new kind of language, you might, a lot of them dirty and vulgar language that is uh, coined online by Chinese uh, internet users or netizens, often to make fun of government policies. Um, and it's, so the, the grass map itself is a very dirty word in Chinese. Uh, so it's a very interesting kind of uh, lexicon to study. It shows the change that has taken place, and it shows how uh, people in every life, in every language, creates new language in order to deal with censorship and government control. So government has been trying very hard to regulate with uh, half successes, but there are some new trends since 2013. That's why 2013 seems to be an interesting turning point, and that's a key word for 2013 in the uh, China Star Yearbook was civility civilization. Some new trends. According to uh, People's Daily Online Surveys in recent years, since about 2013, the number of protest events online has declined. At the same time, the number of online incidents, or news incidents, you know, online incidents, with positive energy has increased, and the number of online incidents with negative energy has decreased. Um, so throughout this talk, I might introduce a number of uh, relatively strange uh, vocabulary. And this positive energy and negative energy are two of them. Um, but they are not, they're not strange. They are actually now very common part of the mainstream discourse in China. Positive energy basically means online discourse that is supportive of government policies and agendas. And negative energy is anything that's critical, that's vulgar, that's messy, that's bad. So the gov part of the gov new recent government agenda is to promote online discourse that can generate positive energy and try to crack down on discourse that generates negative critical energy. So this, these are some of the new trends that has happened, ha happened and have been happening since 2013. 2013 was a turning point because it was a, uh, really the first year when the current new leadership uh, came to power. You know, uh, President Xi Jinping took office at the end of 2012. So it started, uh, uh, so basically all these changes have to do with uh, a new leadership and new policies that have been implemented uh, in the governance of Chinese society broadly and the Chinese internet more specifically. So uh, these new trends, my main sort of uh, task today is try to explain, offer explanation of why, you know, after so many years of a contentious web, Chinese website seems to be now, at least for, for the time being, harnessed. That is, uh, you know, it's not as contentious as before, at least uh, on the surface. My main argument is, uh, is that it is because of the, you know, this deployment of a new discourse of civilization and civility for, for the purpose of uh, governing the internet. So I'm going to have to explain, uh, go over some of the ideas of civility and the history of the discourse of civility and civilization in China. Um, when we talk about censorship, there is the traditional liberal view of censorship, which basically refers to government censorship. That the government you know, uh, sort of deletes um, all 
use, use, uses preventive or punitive means to limit people's speech. That's the traditional liberal view of censorship. Um, most of current research on the internet censorship in China, I would uh, argue, uh, follows this uh, traditional view, liberal view of censorship. It's a limited view, basically focusing on government as the censor and government authorities and agencies and institutions as the censors. Uh, and the focus, we have a number of very popular influential uh, studies which show what kind of uh, words are more likely to be censored, right? Uh, dissidents are harassed uh, and, and websites blocked and so on. We know very well. Uh, this um, this phenomenon, but I'm going to argue that uh, censorship uh, is not exercised only by state only by the state. It may also be exercised by non-state actors and in non-coercive ways. And communication in general may be censored through informal and indirect methods social norms and ideology. In fact, what we may argue that the most effective form of censorship is the absence of censorship, the absence of explicit censorship. It's ideological censorship. It's social norm that prevents people from speaking what they could have spoken. Right? Um, and therefore, if we, if we allow that censor, we have this new conception of censorship, as a broader view of censorship, then we may argue that the discourse of civility and civilization is part of this new censorship agenda and is used to censor communication in, a particular, in particular ways. When we talk about civility in general, we think of civility as a norm, you know, civil behavior, uncivil behavior. So there are these debates about are the presidential debates becoming more and more uncivil? Right? There's uh, use, I mean, American presidential debates. Uh, even there are a lot of also arguments, debates about American society becoming more and more uncivil and other disagree. So that, when we have this kind of debate, the assumption is that civility is the norm. It's a norm for a particular kind of behavior. And this is the traditional view of civility. But we can also think of civility in a different way. And uh, here I'm borrowing an idea from um, um, political scientist uh, Susan Herbst, uh, which she develops in Root Democracy, book Root Democracy, where she argues that we should, uh, in, in view of the difficulties of resolving whether or not American society is becoming more civil or more uncivil, let's take a different approach to civility and think of civility, civility as a strategic tool for specific purposes. And if we take this view, then we will ask questions like, when and when do presidential candidates use civil or uncivil rhetoric in public debates? And we will understand that incivility, rude remarks, rude uh, Talk, rude speech can sometimes have more, if more you know, powerful effect, rhetorical effects than civil discourse. So uh, we can think of civility as a tool or as a technology. And I'm going to use both. I, we can think of civility as both norm and tool. So now to the uh, discourses of civility and civilization in China. This goes back. Uh, to the uh, er, to, you know, early 20th century, late 19th century, when Chinese intellectuals at that time were um, really struggling, thinking very hard about uh, uh, modernizing China. So the early efforts to modernize China borrowed the language of civilization from the Western discourses. So what Chinese intellectuals at that time uh, advocated Wen being the Chinese term, Chinese language, Chinese for, uh, term for civilization, as a national strategy for radical social transformation. So it has a long history of usage um, of this term Wen Ming. The Chinese term Wen Ming can be translated uh, in multiple ways as civilization, as civil, as civilized, or as civility, you know, all these different ways. So I'm going to make a distinction here. I will translate civil, women as civilization. Women as civilization will be viewed as an ideology. Civilization as an ideology or as a norm. 
and women as civility will be viewed as a tool or a technology. Okay. Uh, so uh, these two distinctions. Very briefly, the idea of civilization as a new ideology in reformed China is very important. It was first introduced by Deng Xiaoping in 1979 in a speech he made uh, actually to a group of writers uh, and intellectuals in 1979 where he basically said that while we are developing our material civilization, which means economic development, we should also pay attention to spiritual civilization. And by spiritual civilization, he means, um, he elaborated in a speech next year, 1980, that it refers to not only education, science, culture, but also communist ideas, ideals, beliefs, morality, discipline, revolutionary standpoints, principles, like relations among people. It's a new set of norms, a new set of ideology, we might argue. It's important that to, to, to emphasize that Deng Xiaoping introduced this idea in 1979. That's the beginning of the reform period of China's economic reform and of the Cultural Revolution. And in, in developing this concept, and then later on in the public discourse, using this concept. This concept was the, the idea of s spiritual civilization was often used to contrast the with the chaos of the cultural revolution. Right? Cultural revolution was the reference point. It was a chaotic time, now we need to be more civilized. So gradually it becomes a new ideology and this ideology was also used to displace the earlier ideology of class struggle, normal class struggle. Now we should focus on uh, moral behavior while we develop, focus on economic development. So this whole uh, idea of civilization, first introduced by Deng Xiaoping, has been a key word in Chinese poli government policies ever since. Every leader since Deng Xiaoping tried to create a new civilization. So Deng Xiaoping's uh, successor was Jiang Zemin. Uh, Mr. Jiang added a uh, you know, in addition to spiritual civilization, Mr. Zhang uh, introduced the concept of political civilization. And that actually brought some hope to the intellectuals at the time because it uh, suggested, signaled the possibility of political change, political civilization. Hu Jintao, who succeeded uh, Jiang Zemin, introduced the idea of social civilization because social civilization meaning more concerned with social justice issues, with social equality issues because of the increasing social inequality at the time. And the current leader, Xi Jinping now, has proposed, often talked about ecological civilization. So civilization is a major kind of master frame uh, in the official discourse. So it functions as an ideological discourse. But at a more concrete level, in the, uh, in, especially in the area of uh, social governance, and in our case, internet governance, governance um, you know, the, the, the women discourse, the discourse of civilization, actually it functions more like a set of technologies, the discourse of civility. Here I'm borrowing uh, literally uh, Foucault's language. So Foucault has technologies of self, technologies of production, technologies of science systems, technologies of power, and we have a parallel for each. So, civility as technology, technologies of production, and we can think of the production of hardware and software for civility projects. One very um, influential example was uh, 2009, the Ministry of Information Technology at the time wanted to introduce a new software green, called Green Dam and Youth Escort. Basically, requiring all computer, all you know, to, to have all the computers pre-installed with this software, it's a filtering software, supposedly to protect juniors. But later on, it was found that actually also censors political speech, and uh, that project was aborted because of uh, resistance and protest in China and outside of China. But this is the production of software and hardware for the. Uh, projection for, for the sort of projects of civility construction. The ubiquitous of civility discourse is now um, really, really uh, ubiquitous. <laughs> when you, in Chinese or, uh, public spaces, you see 
uh, this history of using billboards and posters as long history. And now you see this the, the, uh, the, the image uh, on the bottom and the top is about um, using using the web in civil ways. Right? Uh, and then uh, when 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 the, when the, uh, uh, the kind of signs about the civil internet uh, they often typically use green color because green green web you know, clean web a healthy web is the typical uh, color the, when we think about uh, civility as technology as a power we think of how civility is often associated with uh, now increasingly uh, increasingly associated with uh, law and order, with national security. To be civil is also for the protection of the nation, national security, and for for the protection of cultural security. There's also this new concept of cultural security. That uh, Chinese culture needs to be protected from the encroachment of dangerous Western, polluting Western values. And one of the more recent uh, uh, development was the Supreme Court uh, had a legal interpretation where basically it required that people who post information online may face up to three years in prison if the posting is viewed more than 5,000 times or retweeted, retweeted 500 times. Um, that, that was in 2013 and just soon after this came out, uh, a, young, a young man, 16, 17 young man was arrested uh, because he posted a message, and that message was reposted, retweeted more than 500 times, and he was calling for a kind of street protest. The most important part of this uh, civility as uh, technology is civility as technologies of the self. Um, there are a lot of things I, would, I have to, I guess I have to rush a little bit. Uh, civility as technologies of self have self-discipline, we've got to be self-disciplined when we use the web, you know. Uh, we've got to, uh, to be self-disciplined, to be civil is also a healthy way of using the web, uh, being healthy. This civil behavior online is also tied to another enduring discourse in Chinese language about citizen quality, su zhi. So there's often a discourse I think the uh, Chinese uh, scholars, historians, and literary scholars have written a lot about this notion of citizen quality. That uh, there has been a long discourse where uh, the official discourse, at least the elite discourse, blames the citizens for for having low quality, you know, not well educated, um, don't understand what democracy is, and uh, therefore China is not. Uh, not ready for democracy because the citizens were of poor quality, especially migrant workers, for instance. So there's a quality education uh, in the school curriculum for a long time. Now, this new kind of online civil behavior is also tied to that kind of citizen quality education. It's also about good manners. It's also about reason, rationality, because a lot of the uh, kind of protest uh, contentious behavior online is very emotional. Uh, so now reason is used to challenge emotional behavior online. You have to, you know, have to manage your emotions. I'll have an uh, example uh, later on. The discourse about civility as technologies of self often appears in its negative form. So you know, what is uncivil is, is, is picked out, what is cruel and barbarian and uneducated. So recently there are kind of this kind of popular practice in, in, in some cities to citizens in a neighborhood, their neighborhood uh, uh, committees and activities organized to vote about what's, what's the most uncivilized online behavior. So this example is from June 2015 in the Yueshou district of the city of Guangzhou. According to the votes of the local community, these are the top 10 uncivil online behavior. Spreading rumors and untruthful information, creating spreading internet viruses, hacking and harassment, cursing, uh, cursing using dirty language in online forums and uh, chat, chat rooms, uh, porn chat, compulsory ads, spinning, uh, spinning, you know, information online, online gambling. In, in. A lot of things actually we, we probably are uh, in agreement with that. We also find this kind of behavior um, uncivil. Uh, so, 
there is a lot of discourse about civility and incivility in online uh, in, in online spaces in online forums, and then there are also a lot of um, what I call pedagog pedagogies of civility, ways and methods of teaching civility behavior online. I listed a few examples. There are civility campaigns. Civility campaigns, online civility campaigns have been going on for quite a while. Um, citizens are selected, model citizens are selected and praised and uh, rewarded for uh, for civil behavior or punished or made an example of for uncivil online behavior. Um, that's another practice. Um, websites may be selected and uh, you know uh, as civilized websites. We also have, there's also another kind of civilized. There are civilized cities, civilized families. There's a whole language about civility, and this has been. Um, also adapted to the uh, to the measurement of uh, online behavior. I highlighted the bottom two because I want to say a, a little bit more about these two these two cases. Um, online civility volunteers uh, is kind of a very interesting new development. Um, uh, these volunteers they are also known as uh, internet commentators, and they are also known as the Fifty Cent Army. Uh, some of you may know it's uh, uh, anonymous, uh, anonymous and voluntary uh, commentators who participate in online discussions, and uh, and they're of course they're they're supposed to say things uh, that uh, that are in supportive in support of government agendas, and uh, they will challenge uh, others. Who are critical of government uh, policies and government leaders? So these are these are internet commentators. Um, in recent years, there has been a systematic effort uh, under the there's there's also a high level ministerial level agency uh, called the Civility Office, Chinese Communist Party Civility Office. I mean that's my rough translation. This office has been organizing has been organizing national uh, projects to recruit civility vol online civility volunteers. And according to one policy document that's published online, uh, actually the government is very explicit about this kind of uh, project. They, are, they, never, they don't hide this kind of behavior, right? So according to one policy document, uh, um, around the country, uh, millions uh, in the million, you know, millions of uh, online civility volunteers are to be recruited in the next few years, and these civility volunteers will will actively participate in online discourse in order to generate positive energy. There is also actually a system of evaluation of uh, of their work and a system of uh, rewards and so on. So it's, it's it's an institution that is developed from internet commentators. There are also training courses of all sorts, and I'll talk about uh, some, some training courses later on. So, two examples. Let me talk about, uh, you know, m more or less uh, f focused on the sort of the major uh, points, uh, relatively abstract. But let me give you a, a couple of concrete examples about how civility as use is used as a technology of control or censorship or surveillance. Um, this case is about the Xia Junfeng. Xia Junfeng was a street peddler. So he, um, uh, you know, street peddler, and their conflicts with the law enforcement uh, authorities in China is uh, one of the major cause of online protest because they're, they're endless uh, these kind of pro, uh, conflicts, uh, and then in the, you know, number of cases. Uh, very prominent, uh, high-profile cases. Whenever such a case ha happens, now in this case, Xia Junfeng in conflict with law, enfo law enforcement, it's called urban or city inspectors, Cheng Guan. They have a no pretty notorious kind of uh, reputation. Um, in conflict uh, with, with the uh, city inspectors, he killed two of them. He killed them. And he was arrested and sentenced to death. But uh, as in 
many other similar cases, the public actually was in sympathy with with, uh, with the street peddler, not uh, with, the, with the police uh, law enforcement authorities. The outpourings, you know, there were uh, a lot of uh, discussions about you know, that they want they, they, they want uh, Shadenfeld to be pardoned and so on, but he was ex executed. Um, in 2000, he was ex executed in 2013, if I remember correctly. Um, a few years after he was uh, he was arrested and sentenced. So this this case happened a week after he was executed. A week after he was executed, his uh, uh, widow, according to Chinese tradition, is the time of memorial. Uh, so his widow basically posted messages on Weibo, um, saying that uh, uh, he had died unjustly, and uh, uh, he posted. Uh, uh, she Zhang Jing, or her name was Zhang Jing, posted a picture on her Weibo and uh, got a lot of uh, supporting uh, messages. People are just out outpouring of sympathy for her and cries of uh, injustice uh, in this case. Again, the sympathy was still with Xiao Jun and with Zhang Jing. And this is the typical kind of uh, um, turn of events for a number of years uh, in the past. But in this case, uh, it was different from the past because uh, soon after people began to pour sympathetic remarks for her. There was a countercurrent. You know. There are many others who began to challenge her, first saying that this photograph that she tweeted was not her husband's photograph. <laughs> and she acknowledged that was true. This was another street peddler who was also, who also sentenced to death. But because uh, I don't know for what reason, maybe she couldn't find a photograph of her husband. She posted this one. This one, other people said she deliberately posted this one because this young man was uh, very emotional. He was crying, and she was, she was trying to use this photograph to arouse people's emotions, to arouse people's sympathy. So this was the kind of counter kind of discourse that was generated against her, and she was very quickly put on the defensive. And this, this is something relatively new in terms of the internet protest activity, because in the past there were similar cases, and it was always overwhelmingly on the side of this uh, of the weak. Um, um, and in the discourse, in the discourse challenging her and challenging her sympathizers, typically people are say, "You are too emotional. You got to use reason. Be rational, right?" And uh, so. According to there, there are also critical discourses, critical of this kind of uh, discourse. And one person charged that a lot of this critical discourse came from the internet commentators, anonymous internet commentators, who are supportive of the government. But government media, official media, was also uh, doing the same thing. So there's one, there's one editorial on Chinese Central TV website, which <coughs> editorial about this case, which. It basically says, that I will quote a passage from, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the editorial. In the face of those excessively emotion-stirring words or fanatic stories, net friends, you know, internet friends, should reduce their impulsive part participation by 30%. <laughs> so, so it is, I mean, Chinese internet culture is very participatory and emotional participation. But here is a uh, clear advice about you know 30 percent uh, less of impulsive participation. Be more calm, more rational, and not just becoming filled with indignation and anger like others. So it's the use of the discourse of civility, reason to challenge the discourse of emotion, indignation, anger, and so on. So emotional becomes irrational, becomes uncivil, is to be eradicated. This is a very interesting case and. Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, debates on, on both sides, uh, and it's relatively a new development. And then a question related to this is uh, uh, people sometimes ask, why would, uh, why would people volunteer 
to support the government, right? Why would people want to be recruited into uh, civility volunteers? A number of things I wanted to emphasize. As I mentioned, that you know, the government uh, is not, uh, does not hide anything. It's very, very explicit. It actually made it very public. This is one ceremony in Shanxi province. Uh, literally means the launching ceremony of uh, uh, youth civility internet civility volunteers in Shanxi province. So it's a public ceremony to um, inaugurate uh, the use the, of uh, civility volunteer. But I, I want to ma mention a few points. First, not all, not all volunteers, online volunteers, internet commentators um, uh, are voluntary. You know, uh, sometimes kind of there, there are very, very uh, strategic and uh, powerful efforts to recruit um, young people by local government agencies. Uh, but I also want to emphasize, this question came up in the class before this, I also want to emphasize that these uh, volunteers may not necessarily be manipulated uh, by government uh, uh, officials. They are not necessarily blind followers. Sometimes they are they are happily, they are happily doing this. They, 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 you know, they, they really volunteer. That's another kind of uh, part of the story. Um, a, a third reason is uh, sometimes people just go along. This is another government campaign. If the government needs to recruit a certain number of volunteers, and I need to be part of the volunteer, I'll just do it, right? It's like, um, and because Ch campaign, China has a history of campaigns. People deal with campaigns uh, uh, in a cool way, right? So uh, just another uh, campaign. The last point I think needs a special emphasis, which is an uh, interesting development of the Chinese cyber culture, uh, is that you know, uh, we now see more and more polari polarization in Chinese online spaces. And liberal discourse is often challenged by a different kind of discourse. You might call it nationalistic discourse or patriotic discourse. There are uh, there is a kind of a social movement, uh, which is a movement, a nationalistic movement, both online and offline. Um, very critical of Western practices and Western values and so on. So there are, in that, in that sense, a lot of these uh, volunteers, online civility volunteers, um, are doing this in a genuine way to challenge discourses that are critical of government behavior and government policies. Uh, next example is about the training courses for managing online crisis. Uh, government agencies at all levels, from the top to the, to the bottom, to the township levels, are uh, uh, nowadays very much concerned with uh, this kind of contentious activities online. So they, you know, whenever something happens, there's a kind of online crisis. A lot of energies now are put into managing this crisis. It's, it often happens that government uh, officials may not be the most savvy uh, users of internet. They do not necessarily actually understand very well internet culture. And therefore, uh, nowadays there are a lot of training programs uh, that uh, target government agencies and government officials to train them to how to make appropriate responses when a crisis or a protest event, event happens online. Because sometimes, uh, the inappropriate response uh, backfires and uh, makes the protest escalate. So now it's like uh, a major um, industry training causes uh, by business firms, but also by uh, government agencies. Like people daily, people daily runs this uh, professional training course for internet opinion analysts, uh, sort of very similar to the internet commentators. Um, for a number of years, and uh, sorry, this is in Chinese, but I'll translate this for you. Uh, for a for a training course lasting for um, uh, five days, four days, from May 25th to May 29th of this year, you need to pay a training fee of 3,981 yuan. Training fee. You need to pay an, uh, another fee miscellaneous fee of 3,820 yuan, and then you need to pay out 2,000 2, yuan for uh, food and accommodation for only four or five days of training program. Uh, 
So, uh, and then on the other side is, is the diploma of uh, training diploma uh, that people receive after the training course. Um, and then there are kind of nowadays online public opinion survey reports which are produced by a number of uh, major research institutions in China which become, which are used as textbooks for, for training uh, government officials. There's also a business, uh, and business firms uh, also train other business firms how to, it's, it's a PR strategy, how to respond to online, online crisis, uh, online, negative online um, discourse. So this is from one website, a training company that uh, trains people how to manage online public opinion. I have some brief translations uh, in the middle of this. So uh, if you take a look at um, um, take a look at the left side. Detailed procedures for firms to manage internet. Yu Qing Yu Qing means public opinion. Uh, strengthen the routine monitoring and and elevate it to the institutional level. You've got to you know make it a priority of your firm. And then there are also different procedures for big firms and for small firms. Different things you might do for the firm. And there is also very specific uh, advice about uh, set, up, set, up, set on the right hand side, set up a team of internet spokespersons and Yu Ting commentators who have very clear set of duties and requirements, responsibilities, and uh, there are four methods for channeling internet opinion, persuasion with reason, overwhelm with power. If you can't persuade with reason, then use power. Uh, change topic, disrupt the topic, these are being taught to government officials and to business executives. You know, uh, sort of ostensibly to, to make uh, the Chinese web a more civilized space, but also it's a way, it's a new form of censorship, I would argue. And it's also a major business involving huge money. What are the consequences of, uh, of this civility and civilization discourse for internet governments? So this is like summing up very briefly. Um, uh, I, I try to argue that civility has become a new institution for censorship with a set of norms, with a bureaucratic organizations. Like at the top there is a civility you know, office and very specific, specific methods. Um, and then with millions of civility volunteers now monitoring the web, it seems that we can argue that the boundaries between surveillance and censorship have become very blurred. We often, you know, we talk about surveillance, the, the whole series of uh, seminar is surveillance, but uh, can we think of surveillance as a form of censorship? Or general, at least in this case, it seems that surveillance has become of a form of censorship because it's all the civility volunteers are watching all the time, right? You know that they are watching, and therefore you'll be careful what you're talking about. And that's a form of uh, effective censorship. And in that sense, surveillance without explicit or coercive censorship may be censorship at its most effective. Um, and then we may also generalize, um, make the point that uh, if surveillance uh, has become censorship, then censorship is now just as ubiquitous as surveillance. Um, so this is sort of more general conclusion. I see uh, we have a little very little time left and I want to leave some time for uh, Q&A. I do have a couple of more slides about resistance, which I'll mention very briefly. Uh, we're, I'm not saying that this civili civility discourse and ideology, methods, pedagogy of, of teaching and training how to uh, you know, cultivate civility uh, has been all powerful and effective. There's always resistance, and I want to mention a few examples. Resistance continues. And one very uh, interesting, remarkable example was 2009 campaign. It was a national campaign, and the campaign was called Anti-Vulgarity Campaign which is a campaign to crack down on uh, online porn and lewd content, you know, vulgar content. So one way that uh, Chinese netizens try to challenge this kind of campaign is to, uh, because of the campaign, a lot of the masterpieces of world art, nude art, uh, were taken offline. 
it's not appropriate content for, for a website. And therefore, uh, some creative uh, people uh, dressed up the nude uh, figures and then put up these, a lot of these if you search. And, and the grass mud lexicon, the whole grass mud lexicon was coined and developed and, and spread in that period. And because of this kind of really parody, uh, political parody and, uh, and satire, uh, the, the entire campaign, I think, uh, uh, really uh, failed. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an effective case of uh, resistance. That was, that was before uh, 2013. There is also kind of hypocrisy in the use of the civility discourse. You know, civility discourse often challenges emotional discourse, but the government uh, uh, sometimes also try to um, win people, win over people through emotional kind of uh, language. This happened this year in June 2015, uh, when uh, you know crews kept, uh, capsized on Yangtze River. A lot of people, over 400 people, died. Because of this, unlike in previous cases, in this time the, the web on Weibo was relatively, you know, uh, not as critical, not as contentious as before, because all these major government agencies and uh, media channels were generating positive energy. And what kind of gener positive energy was being generated? This is one example. After a while, some people posted top ten top 10 mass media titles uh, about the, this incident, the, the ten, top 10 most disgusting titles, the news stories, titles of news stories. Well, number one is, on ground zero, China's most handsome men are all there. Uh, so this is about, uh, the, about the, uh, the relief efforts. All the media attention was about positive energy, right? So it's about the handsome men, the, the people who were Trying to say, but not about the victims, not about their families. And then there are also even some success language. How fortunate to be born a Chinese, because because the government is helping everybody. And then the challenging discourse. The challenging discourse is uh, the, the third example is challenging. You know, to be supportive of government is supposed to be rational, but why is it rational to be supportive of the government? So this is a kind of uh, interesting. Uh, interaction between uh, the kind of positive energy and negative energy in online discourse and the civility, hypocrisy of civility. And the, another recent example is the Tianjin explosion, major explosion. Um, and after, after the media, local media in Tianjin was completely uh, almost quiet. Um, and the Weibo, which has, which has been very quiet for a long, for a number of years, suddenly exploded with energy, with, this time with en negative energy, very critical. So I'm, I'm suggesting here there are contingencies like disasters, earthquakes, and, which will uh, suddenly uh, wake people, the stagnant, uh, you know, um, wake up the web and contention can happen uh, in very powerful ways again. So this is kind of, uh, um, what I'm suggesting is that there are always possibilities of resisting, challenging the discourse of civility and government. Thank you. I'll stop here. So we have time for one or two questions. So, can we? sort of picks up on the, the point of resistance. Um, it seems like when the, the policy of civility so sort of um, speaks to virtually every facet of behavior, you, know, you said ecological civility, um, personal civility, and then it even extends to one's sort of personal health. Um, I'm curious, do are there forms of resistance that sort of take that up by, you know, does it become the form of just being unhealthy or you know littering or something and like so it, it seems like resistance is, is sort of cut off at that point uh, and one has to sort of challenge the binary a little bit in terms of you know to be civil is always to support the government right or I, I guess I'm curious if you could extend your discussion. It's, it's a, that's an excellent point and uh, I'm trying to make an argument by really focusing on that uh, that point about civility as a technology 
of control and sensitive. But I'm not saying that civility um, is as simple as that. Uh, so as you suggested, uh, um, people are genuinely, genuinely often um, critical and resentful of uncivil behavior of all sorts. Li literary is one, you know, tourists, Chinese tourists, uh, all kind of uh, scandalous behavior, often challenged and exposed online. So there's that kind of, uh, uh, and the government, uh, sometimes a government official, can very skillfully link their discourse about internet civility to the discourse of general social civility. So Chinese society needs to be more civil, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a mark of, uh, of modernity, of more modern, modern world. And in that sense, that's, that's, I think that's partly why. And I'm not saying this is just like completely unpopular. I think some people actually uh, are very supportive of this discourse. But it's also for that reason, it's becoming an effective form of control. Uh, especially given that the early and more coercive form of control uh, has not uh, so that's a really great point. Thank you. Has, the, has that uh, Supreme Court in the three years in Britain um, ever been enforced in Germany? Only once, as far as I know. And that's uh, uh, several weeks after it was publicized, I guess, to show that there's a policy here and there. But it has, uh, hasn't been uh, evolved again since then. Um, so this, again, for, for you know, with all Chinese policies, the Chinese government make a lot of policies, but once they are made, uh, they are shelved, and they are forgotten until at some point some government official might want to use it, and then it's uh, revived. So not been used uh, since then, as far as I know. Uh, very simple question. Do you think it's uh, ridiculous or resident to China? Say it again. I do, I do think it's uh, ridiculous or reasonable to China, to Chinese government, or to the country of China. I don't understand your question. So is the civility. is civility uh, as a kind of overarching norm mm. um, an appropriate way? Uh, is it reasonable or ridiculous in the context of China? Oh, all right. right. Thank you. Thank you for translating <laughs> that uh, question. Uh, it's, it's completely understandable, given uh, you know, early on, I was relatively brief in covering the earlier history of civilization and civility, but there's a long history of civility and civilization from the early 20th century about the importance of you know, cultivating citizen quality. Uh, so it, it comes directly from that kind of uh, history. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I didn't mention this, I should have mentioned, the whole set of uh, pedagogies of teaching civility, like the campaigns I mentioned, uh, model citizens, uh, uh, model websites, all these are not new in terms of the, you know, it's, it's a traditional, familiar uh, form of public education in China, um, going back at least to the Mao period, model citizen. The model citizen is, is uh, you know, heroes for others to emulate good civil websites for others to learn from. Learn from lay form, right? The, the campaign is now back in. So this is all kind of uh, the confusion. There's a confusion ideal here behind all this, which is that the citizens are teachable. We want to educate. Uh, but the assumption is that a lot of citizens have low quality. And then through this kind of campaign, education, and so on, we can turn them into more civilized. So in that sense, it's totally understandable. But how well it works, I'm still not, uh, I'm, I'm dubious about the effects of this. It seems to be, I think, effective in the sense of containing very contentious and radical discourse online. Last really quick question. Um, do you think there's a connection between the sort of civility campaign and the more broad anti-corruption drive? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how this fits in with the government's other policies. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the anti-corruption campaign, um, corruption has been a major cause of online protest. Actually, a lot of the major cases uh, basically exposed corrupt officials. So it's targeting individual officials, exposing them, and then the officials will be prosecuted and so on. Uh, I don't see there is a direct connection between the civilian campaign and an anti-corruption kind of campaign. 
I see the civility campaign as part of a broader agenda of the new government leadership, new party leadership, to uh, manage Chinese government society. There's a very conscientious efforts to, to improve governance, uh, social gov offline you know, society as well as online so uh, society. So the civility campaign is part of that bigger agenda. But the anti-corruption campaign, a lot of uh, analysts argue that it has a very clear political agenda, is to challenge uh, the kind of uh, rivals, right, the factional rivals within the party. Um, but of course, I think when the uh, when we see the kind of decline of the frequency of online protest, um, uh, we also see at the same time the government crackdown, actually corruption. Is, is important in understanding the, net, net the declining number of protests. And I, I've made an argument in the recent article, uh, if the government, if there's you know, fewer corruption officials, if the government can effectively curb corruption, then it can also reduce the number of protests. Right. In other words, online protest has deeper social and political rules. If the government deals with those questions and problems, then we'll see a more civil web. Great. Well, thank, thank you very you much. much.